Well, good morning. Um, I'm Dr. Ruth Lee Martin, the Acting Executive Director at the Australian American Fulbright Commission. And um, this is one of the first times we've tried a webinar. So um, do be patient with us if uh, we have a few technical um, things that, that happen. Um, but we're really, really excited to be with you today and we hope you get a lot of benefit out of this presentation. It's really going to be focused on getting you a fantastic, strong application and um, so I think you will find the things that we're going to go through quite useful. So just a little bit about us, as you know, with the Australian American Fulbright Commission, we're based here in Canberra and um, we have a small team here. We're about seven, seven of us working at the Commission, so we are quite a small staff, but we really do a lot of, um, a lot of uh, high quality work and uh, a lot of outreach here. So as I've said, the main objective today is to help you write a strong application, an application that's competitive and one that really addresses the central mission of the Fulbright Commission. So you have to remember that we are an educational and cultural exchange program at, at our very heart. So I'm going to give you a short overview in this presentation of what the Fulbright Commission Selection Committee members are looking for in a strong application. Once this part's complete, we'll get on to some Fulbright myth busting and hopefully explode some of those commonly held misconceptions about Fulbright. After that, we'll have time for a Q&A and uh, so you can start submitting your, uh, uh, any questions that you have via the, comment, co the comments um, email address which is public.relations at fulbright.com.au. So let me just give you that email address again, public.relations at fulbright.com.au. So start sending your questions in as we go through the, um, this presentation. So I'm going to answer, as I said at the end, some of the questions that you put to me, but I also need to let you know that we do have a page of FAQs on our website and um, so we'll also, I'll also be able to refer you to that if, if it's a commonly asked question that you can easily get from our website. So let's talk about key selection criteria. So before the pen hits the paper, or perhaps more relevantly, how before the fingers hit the keyboard, uh, to understand some of the background of the Fulbright Commission is really vital to putting in a strong application. You need to do your homework, in other words. With any scholarship proposal, you have to explain how your project fits within the organisation's objectives. So you need to get an understanding of the background of Fulbright. What are our objectives? What's our mission? If you have a really good understanding of that, that will provide some of the terrific groundwork that you need on which to build a strong application. So I can't emphasize enough how important it is to become familiar with our website and you can find it at www.fulbright.com.au. So before you begin to write, you have to understand the objectives of the commission and prepare yourself to address them. Learn about the Fulbright Commission. Check out our organisation's journals, our publications and, and have a good look around the, the website. Look at our mission statement. That would be the first port of call for me if I was putting in an application. Look at some of the other scholars. What have they done? Um, on the website, it's got a, a, there's a heading called Fulbrighters and if you click on there, you'll see some of the um, successful uh, scholars and have a look at the projects that they've been engaged in. Give you some ideas and some pointers. And do a little bit of research on our history, the history of the Fulbright Commission and Senator Fulbright. Research carefully the scholarships on offer. This is really important. Make sure that your application fits beautifully in with the scholarship category that you're going for. So as far as the selection process, 
the written applications go to various committees. If you're a postgraduate, the committee will be in the state that you live in. So it might go to New South Wales if you're living in Sydney or if you're living in Melbourne, it'll go to the Victorian committee. All the other committees have their separate committee selection committees. There's one for the postdocs, there's one for the professionals, and there's one for the senior scholars as well. The selection committee members consist of, there's usually six on the panel, they're high level individuals from both academia and government. And it's also important to note, I think, that we also have representation on these committees from the US Embassy. So what then are the four key points around which this selection uh, process works. What are the selection panels? What, 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 the, what are they looking for? What do they seek in successful Fulbrighters? So as you can see on your screen here, we're looking at your track record of excellence. We're looking then at the project itself. We're looking at the development of bilateral, binational partnerships. And we're looking at ambassadorial skills. So now I'm going to spend a little bit of time addressing each of these key selection criteria. Okay, so we are indeed looking for a track record of excellence. And regard will be given to professional distinction and that can be gauged in a variety of ways. We might look at some awards you've won, some prizes, have you uh, been given any other grants before in the past? Are there any commendations from, you know, different groups or um, from your place of work or from your university? Do you have public recognition, especially, you know, and now if we're looking at maybe the senior scholars or um, the professionals, what kind of public profile would you have? Do you have recognition there? Have there been reviews of your work? especially if you're uh, uh, in the creative arts, we'd be looking at um, reviews that talk about your work, um, maybe looking at the places that you perform if you're a musician or hold exhibitions if you're an artist. Um, what kind of publication uh, do you have? What, what's the output? Are they uh, national journals? Are they international? So we're looking at kind of that whole thing that whole picture of you in, in regards to your track record. Also, if you're a postgraduate, important to know that we will indeed be looking at university transcripts and they are required at postgrad level. So let's move along now and get to the nitty gritty, if you like. This is uh, gonna be a rather large section because I'm gonna focus now on the project itself. So I think that when you begin to pull your project together, you really need to think about structure. Like any good piece of writing, a scholarship project has to have a sound structure. It needs to have a logical flow and should be relatively easy for the reader to negotiate. So remember that you're dealing with um, selection committee members here who might be reading um, large quantities of applications. So you really need to get out of the way, if you like, with clutter, um, cluttering it up with um, maybe grammatical inf inf um, inconsistencies and so forth. So you really need to focus on that and make sure that it's uh, really, you know, it's got a great logical flow. The opening paragraph I think is crucial. This is where you're really pitching your idea to the selection committee and you don't have a lot of time to do that in. So in that first paragraph, you must convince the selection uh, committee members that your research project is really important and it's exciting too. So ask yourself the questions. Why should the selection committee members care about my project? Also ask, What's going to make my application stand out from all the others? So keep two things in mind here. First, the reviewer, the person, the selection committee member is not going to be a specialist in your area. 
In fact, the chances of them even being in the same discipline as you are not great. Your civil engineering proposal might be viewed by an electrical engineering professor and also by a professor in the humanities. So one key hint here is to keep your project readable. It should be uh, pitched to an educated person who is not in your area. So don't put off the selection committee members by making them wade through a sea of jargon that's specific to your discipline. Another thing to avoid is avoid uh, cutting and pasting from your latest research grant applications if you're a professional or a senior scholar. That really stands out. It's quite easy to pick. Um, and you also need to ensure that you get, get several people, I would suggest, to review your application before you submit it. Get somebody from in your field, but also get somebody from without, from another field as well. So that you can ask them, is it readable? Is it clear? Do I need to work on the clarity? If I loaded it up with too much jargon and so forth and get some good feedback on them from them. Um, so the second thing uh, is that selection committee members are going to be reading many, many applications. So again, I'm getting back to this idea of having a concise and well-organized structure. It's really crucial. So given these two facts, um, that the reviewer won't be a specialist in your area and that they will be reading a lot of applications, it's really important to make every word count from the very start of your proposal. And what I would do, would suggest that you do, is to write your application and, uh, and draft it and edit it and work on it. And then the very last thing, I would go back into the opening paragraph and make sure that it's really punchy. With the Fulbright application, you're also going to have a personal statement to fill out. This is approximately one page and it's all about who you are. The personal statements are kind of like a narrative in which you can include information about your education, practical experience, your special interests, your career plans, and most of all, your purpose for studying in the US. Now, for some people, doing the uh, personal statement is difficult because it's all about you. But what the Fulbright Selection Committee are looking for is a rounded picture of the individual. We might have your academic um, uh, track record. We've got your project, which looks viable. But who is this person? Um, we want to know more about your character. So here we have uh, a couple of, um, of our successful applicants. We've got Alison Wichart and Stefan Shepard. Um, as you can see, Alison went from ANU to study at Harvard in medical anthropology. And there's a lovely quote from her. She says, through my research, I hope to foster greater understanding and awareness of the challenging experiences faced by women. So already you can see coming from Alison's application um, and uh, her attitude to, towards her field, that's very much one of giving back. With St Stefan Shepard, he was the 2015 Fulbright postdoc scholar. He went from Swinburne University in Melbourne to the University of Arizona. And he says, my research seeks to establish how cultural engagement and spirituality plays a role in building resilience and diverting Native Americans from the justice system. Again, you have a wonderful person here who's really um, focused on giving back to community. So in a, an overview of their applications will give us the following. Their proposals were written cl very clearly and with great clarity. The proposals had a very good underlying structure. Their project proposals were doable within the timeframes of the scholarship. So if you're going to the States and the scholarship might be, if it's professional or senior, it might be for three or four months. That's not a long period of time. So don't write a project that is clearly going to take 18 months when you only have three or four months in the States. The timeframes in these applications were really well organised and viable and you can even build in a calendar. You know, in um, 
at this part of the year, it might be October, I want to get this done. In November, I want to get this done and so forth so that we can see that it's really clear and viable. The personal statements too showed how caring these two are and how they look outward and how they're so willing to share their knowledge and expertise with others. So the next point I'm going to talk about is to what degree do projects need to be bilateral or binational? Well, one of the key goals of the Fulbright Commission is to widen and deepen the relationship between the US and Australia. So your project absolutely needs to address this. Why do you need to go to, a, to, to the US? Why do you say, why can't you go to the UK and do your project? There needs to be an overwhelming reason why it can only be done in the US. And I think that that needs to come through very clearly in your, in your proposal. Other things we're gonna ask you for are a host letter. So why is a host letter important? How do I go about getting one? Well, um, the host letter is really, really important because it shows the beginning of an establishing a relationship between you and the place that you're going to go to, your nominated place. At postgraduate level, we're not too concerned with a host letter. So just be aware of that. And in fact, um, we can help you with that post-grad level. We can give you a little bit of hand-holding, if you like, with that um, once you go forward, if you're, if you're lucky enough to go forward. But at all other levels, postdoc, professional and senior, we absolutely expect to see a really good host letter. What makes a good host letter? Okay, so a host letter should be more than saying, I will give uh, Professor so-and-so a desk and a chair. That's really, really basic. It's not what we're looking for. We want to see already some kind of um, sharing of knowledge going on it's where you might as a senior lecturer um, agree to give a forum or a seminar or, or um, do some mentoring of some students. We're not looking for people teaching seminars um, over a long period of time but to go and give guest lectures and take the odd seminar, engage in forums, uh, maybe mentor some students is absolutely what we're looking for and if that comes through in the host letter that there's going to be this kind of sharing of, of ideas and expertise, that's really Fulbright gold and that, that is um, really highly valued. So in terms of referees, which I'm just going to include at, at, at this point, um, really give due consideration to your referee reports. As I've said before in my um, presentations on the Fulbright scholarships, they are confidential, so you will never know what has been written in those referee reports. So it makes it really important that you choose very carefully. Maybe you have a meeting with your potential referee first to, to kind of suss them out and see if they're really going to, you know, put their weight behind this and give you 100% of their support. The referees are asked to comment on your the applicant's suitability to undertake the project. And it's also, they will also base their recommendation on, uh, if you're post-grad, on your academic um, uh, track record. And if you're a professional or senior or postdoc, they'll look at your professional qualifications, including your publications. They'll also might comment on your character and importantly for Fulbright, they might also comment on your adaptability to cope within a different culture. So on the, on the online form, you will be asked to nominate three referees and provide a, an email address for them. And that will generate an email that will go to your referees with a form and they send it directly back to us. So it does not go to you. You need to make sure though that your referees get their um, referee reports in on time. And sometimes that includes a bit of pushing and just reminding them that the deadline is indeed drawing close and they need to get those in. Once they're all in, you will get a, an email from uh, the Fulbright Commission saying that they've been accepted, um, saying that all your referees have been accepted and that they're in. Just be aware that if we only get one referee report in, 
we actually cannot assess your application. It makes it ineligible. So that's something to consider. Um, another thing, when you're doing the application, just be aware that there are some state and territory scholarships which give you an additional opportunity, if you like, another bite of the cherry. And to be eligible for a Fulbright state or territory scholarship, you have to be a permanent resident in the state and you have to be committed to going back there at the end of your project. You have to be associated with an institution, organisation within that state. In other words, you need to be working in the state. And you clearly need to outline the benefits that you will bring to the state uh, by doing your work. So there has to become some kind of relevance to the state. This can be a bit overwhelming for some people, but you know, if it can just be within your discipline. So think of it as a contribution to your discipline within the state. And that kind of takes care of that um, idea of, oh, you know, I don't know if this is going to be relevant for the state. Everything really can be made relevant to the state. You just need to, to put it down clearly in the half page that we ask of you. Be aware too that as far as the state and territory scholarships go, for the Northern Territory, Tasmania and the ACT, they go across four categories. So post-grad, post-doc, professional and senior scholar. For all other states, they only go across post-grad and post-doc. Okay, so let's move along a little bit now and I'm going to take you to the development of binational or bilateral partnerships. So these are really, really important considerations of Fulbright. I sometimes say that Fulbright is greedy. Fulbright actually wants it all. Not only does it want this amazing, well-rounded character with a, an extraordinary ability to share their expertise and willing also to take on other people's ideas, we're also looking for people with the capacity to build ongoing collaborations, linkages and partnerships. We want them to be enduring. And uh, indeed, some of our Fulbright alumni have got partnerships that are going on for over 20 years. I kid you not, that's quite extraordinary. So I've got here um, Colin Scholz, who's a, been a really great example of the types of collaborations and partnerships that we're looking for. So there you can see he's got an ongoing research collaboration between the Cooperative Research Centre for Greenhouse Gas Technologies from the University of Melbourne and the University of Texas in Austin. Uh, the one thing about him is that he's really focused on building strong partnerships when he was in the US on his scholarships and they've lasted over a number of years. And then when he, when he was back in Australia as one of our alumni, he was then awarded what we call a FAG grant. Um, this is a grant especially targeted at our alumni and he furthered his engagement with his partners and used the money that he got from the FAG grant to go back to the US again and to um, uh, really deepen the collaborations that he had. So this partnership that he's got between um, the University of Melbourne and the University of Texas uh, is a really strong one. It's gone over now a number of years and um, still is producing some wonderful work. So the capacity, capacity to build strong and vigorous networks on a number of levels is an attribute that we really highly value. Okay, so turning our attention to another facet of the selection uh, key criteria, ambassadorial skills. Fulbright are looking for people with ambassadorial skills. So what does that mean, really? What, what does it mean? Well, it means we're looking for people, again, with a willingness to engage with others, to share their own experiences and knowledge and to form lasting bonds. We're also looking for people that might have a, a, you know, a sense of diplomacy as they will really be presenting out into the, the public sphere, the Fulbright brand, and they also represent the US and Australian governments because that's, after all, where our funding comes from. So 
We're looking for people who are flexible, who can be open to new ideas, who when they go to the US can really open themselves up to some new experiences and really take them on board wholeheartedly. And we're also, again, I keep harking back to this, but it's really important, that willingness to share your expertise, to engage in a very dynamic way with different communities, different groups of people, uh, people from backgrounds from all over the place, really diverse people. So we're looking for that kind of spirit, if you like, in people. So that's really the end of the, the overview, but... Before I finished off, I did promise you that I'd explode some Fulbright scholarship myths. So here we go. Myth number one, I need a university medal to get a Fulbright scholarship. Well, not true. While it is a competitive pro program and the majority of postgraduates do indeed have first class honours, it's also about what you're proposing to do why and you the character. So this is where that personal statement really comes in. So if you've got a track record which is, you know, it's pretty good but it doesn't maybe, you know, it's not maybe perhaps as quite as good as you would like it, then you can fall back on your personal statement and on your ambassadorial skills or your um, capacity to build partnerships. So remember that Fulbright are looking at the whole picture. A whole picture so if you haven't got one thing or you're not particularly strong in one thing you may be really strong on the other three things and that will certainly be taken into account myth number two do I have to come from a sandstone university or group of eight in Australia not true we have wide university representation across all states and we're absolutely thrilled to say from all universities in Australia and in the US. So when you're thinking about a, about a host, think outside the box when you're going to the US. You might get more support and a lot more uh, enthusiasm if you go off the beaten track a little bit. If you're in Australia and you come from one of the, the regional universities, we will be thrilled to have your application. And uh, we really can see that there's excellence in all universities around Australia. Right, myth number three, let's explode this one. You have to be a certain age to get a Fulbright. Not true. Fulbright scholarships have been granted to people from 22 to over, well over 60 years of age. And um, we have had Fulbrighters 65 and even pushing a little bit beyond that. So the great news is that there is no age limit. If you have the skills that we're looking for, the character, the personality and the, um, the track record, then yes, we're absolutely open to looking at your application. So I think that will do for, the, uh, for exploiting the scholarship myths. You might have some more that you can send in to me uh, via email and I'll be really happy to look at those. So for now, I'm going to switch over to the Q&A and see if we've got any questions coming in. Okay, so we do have a question here and it's asking me, do I need a support letter from my home organisation? What a great question, something I didn't think of in my uh, putting together my presentation. No, you don't. Obviously, if you're working at the uh, a university, you need to negotiate with them to get some time off to go and do your, your work. And that's accepted. Fulbright has such a prestigious name um, that your university will be falling over themselves, hopefully, to facilitate your uh, capacity to take up a Fulbright scholarship. But you don't actually need a letter from your home organisation per se. Um, this um, question also says, am, I'm interested to apply for both professional and senior scholarships. Do I need to fill in two application forms? Okay, so that this too is a really good question. You don't. You can ask to be considered for two different scholarships cat 
scholarship categories. But I must make it very clear, you cannot go across post-grad and post-doc. The postgraduate scholarships all are looked after by the IIE, which is our sister organisation uh, funded by the State Department in the US. And they go into a completely different category than all the others. So they have a different form and different criteria um, on, the, on the application form. Everybody else, postdocs, professionals, senior scholars, go into the same box. They're looked after by the CIES, another sister organisation in the US. And um, so if you say want to be considered for a senior scholarship and also a professional scholarship, you can do that and you don't need to write a new application. You just need to, um, to make it clear on your application that you need to be considered for both categories and that's fine. Okay, so let's move on to another question. Um, do the personal statement proposals require a bibliography list of references? Um, that is a good question and I would certainly put in a truncated list of references uh, for if I was putting in an application because we need to see where some of these ideas are coming from and like any application if you're putting in an ARC grant you will be expected to give a full listing but here Fulbright will only ask for a shortened version, a cut down version of some key uh, references that you're using. Um, okay, so there's a there's something that I need to um, to deal with now. Coming, just looking at the questions that are coming in, that the Embark system. So when you go on and do your application, you log on to a system called Embark. You must realise that this system has application forms which are generic. Unfortunately, they are generic and they go over 166 countries. So we have specific, um, specific instructions for Australians. You must follow the Australian um, instructions and don't worry. Sometimes they'll say, look, you know, you need do not contact US um, universities or it might say something like, please contact the Fulbright Commission before you begin an application. That is not necessary and if you read carefully the Australian instructions, you'll find that those things should be ignored and just if you stick to the Australian instructions, you will be fine. Okay, another good question coming in here from somebody called Michael um, and he's asking for a postgraduate scholarship, does the host institution have to be a university or can it be other form, some other form of research institute? Uh, Michael, the good news is it can be another form of research, research institute. Um, the uh, host doesn't have to be um, necessarily a university, but it should be a, an organisation with a reputable um, history and standing in the community. So that gives you a little bit more scope, a little bit more room to, to move as well. Okay, so Kate here from Queensland asks, to what degree should I discuss my research project in the personal statement section? Well, I would say not at all, really. You might refer to it obliquely, but really what we're looking for in that personal statement is we want to know about you. What are you like? What, what are your characteristics? Um, is it all about me, 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 or is it about us? So those kinds of things we're looking for. So I would keep any discussion of your research within that section to a minimum. Okay, maybe time for just a couple more questions here. Somebody called Michelle has written in, can I submit a host letter from the institution after applications close? I'm so glad that you wrote in with that, uh, Michelle, because that's a really important question. Yes, you can. So the only the only, only, only piece of material that we will accept after the closing date of the 1st of August is a host letter. Sometimes they can take a little bit of time to come in 
um, and um, so we will accept them. Be aware though that in the timeline of assessment of the applications, we're looking at September to do have the meetings of all the selection committees. So your host letter really needs to be in. If you were fortunate enough to be shortlisted for interview, you, you'd need to have your host letter by then. So yes, the, the answer to that is yes. Okay, somebody called Lila has asked me, will previous unsuccessful attempts for a Fulbright Fellowship ever be reviewed along with a current application. Well, I have good news for you too, Lila. No, in a word, we don't keep records or um, track uh, past applications. In fact, it's quite the opposite. What we're looking for is people who've put in applications to put them in again and even again and even again. So we're really proud this year to have one successful Fulbrighter who applied three times. And nobody was clapping and cheering more loudly than the selection committee, let me tell you, because points for pers perseverance, points for persistence, points for passion. So here, here, here this, this uh, successful scholar was ticking all the right boxes and we just thought, wow, so passionate about the project, not going to be deterred by a few knockbacks, comes back fighting, Yes, there's the scholarship. So that's the really good news is that we don't keep track of them. And um, the only thing I need to tell you though is if you have applied before, a uh, little bit tricky again with the some of the logistics, you need to actually have a new email address to provide a new email access for the Embark project. So re just remember if you used uh, this email address for last year's application, please get a new one, a fresh one for this year's application and put it straight in and uh, as I said kudos to these people for their persistence and um, you know their tenacity. Okay, um, I've got an email here from Anna. I'm interested to know if the research needs to be strongly linked to the research I'm already conducting in my PhD. Another great question. Well, we're hoping if you're doing a PhD and you want a Fulbright scholarship, we're hoping that the time in the US will really add value to your Fulbright, uh, to your PhD project. But yet again, it needs to be kind of discreet as well at the same time. So I'd be thinking about something that you could turn into a journal article, but also can rewrite and um, absorb into chapters of your PhD. So that's the kind of thing we'd be looking for, a kind of discreet project, but something definitely within the field that can be funneled in and used um, to really enhance the PhD. So I need to also let you know the good news at this point too is that if you're doing a PhD in Australia and you're successful with your Fulbright application, well guess what? Your PhD candidature will be suspended while you go and do your 10 months of research in the US and then when you come back to Australia you can pick it up as if you'd never left. So it actually gives you extra time with your PhD and um, really we're looking to really add value from the experience in the US to really, you know, take your PhD if you like to a higher level. Okay, so Ashley um, is asking what do the interviews involve? That's a good question as well. Uh, the interview, so first of all, let me tell you that we do a short listing of all the applications after they're assessed by their various, we've got uh, 16 selection committees, after they're assessed by the various committees, we then do a short list and we uh, get, them, get the, the list ready for interview. The interview takes half an hour. If you're a postgraduate, the interview will be in your state and has to be face to face. I'm sorry about that, but at this point in time, we insist on either um, all face-to-face -face or all by Skype. But for postgraduates, it's definitely um, it's definitely face-to-face. -face. For all others, postdocs, professionals, seniors, we do all of them by Skype. 
Uh, so that does free you up to move around a little bit more. But you kind of, you, you exchange one benefit, if you like, for um, the loss in another area because you don't have that same immediacy that a face-to-face -face interview gives you. However, we do find that the Skype process is a good, good one and why we say it's all or nothing, all people, say the, the Canberra committee is meeting and there's somebody in Canberra and they want to do an interview face-to-face -face and they're a postdoc, we will say no, they still have to do it by Skype because we want everybody on the same level playing field. Okay, so we've got another question here from Flavia. Um, do I fill out a uh, the postdoc state? Okay, so sh what she's asking for is for the postdoctoral state scholarship, do you fill out a separate application? No, you don't. You do the same application, but we will ask you to write half a page and you'll see it in the application. It'll say, do you want to be considered for state scholarship? You tick and then a page will come up and you just need to put in half a page of what I was saying before of how your um, research will benefit the state that you're living in. Um, so you will be asked to provide that additional information or if you're going for an Anne Wexler scholarship, if, if you're interested in public policy, again, you'll have to show, do a half page to show um, the benefits of um, you receiving that scholarship, the benefits. So be aware of that. Okay, so now we've come to our last question because we're almost out of time here, just a little bit over time. And from Simon, um, he asks, how does Fulbright view projects that are standalone or autonomous versus projects that are part of a larger project that may have already have begun? Okay, so what you need to show is some sense in the same way that the PhD needed to show a sense of discrete, having a discrete project, here you would as well. We are supportive of larger projects, but then the question that might be asked is, okay, so this person is already engaged in this research in the States. Why should we give them a scholarship when we've got, you know, 20 outstanding applications here? And I think that this guy can do it on, on his own. It's going to keep going regardless. So you actually have to make a case for why you need Fulbright funding to maybe, I'd say, do a step up with the application, with the, sorry, with the research, that you're going to take the research in a new direction. There has to be something, some reason for why we would then um, fund you um, for a project that's already running really smoothly and is ongoing. So you need to make a very strong case that this is why you need Fulbright uh, funding and this is what Fulbright's going to get in return. Okay, so look, I think we'll leave it there. As I said, this is our very first webinar that we've done. I really hope that it's answered uh, some of your questions and given you some ideas on how to build a really strong, competitive and viable application. And um, I'd really like to thank you for participating in this. I'd also like to thank a couple of Fulbright staff here. We've got Alex McLaurin and Donna and I really want to thank them for all their hard work in pulling this webinar together. We'll answer any of your questions that, um, that, have, that come in via email. If they're really, really complex, you may get a phone call from the Commission. But be assured that we will go through all of your emails um, over the next few days. Just we're, As I said, we're a very small team, so give us a little bit of time here and we will get through all the questions. Now, finally, in signing off, just remember to press that submit button on the 1st of August. The 1st of August we close, there will be no, uh, no material coming in or accepted after the 1st of August except that uh, host letter that we spoke about. Do go to our website, familiarise yourself with Fulbright as I've already said and um, thank you all so much. We're looking forward very much to getting some really truly wonderful applications this year. Okay, from the Fulbright Commission, We'll talk again soon. Bye-bye.